This is uh, uh, the late Georgian Lampoon, a graphic satire of uh, phrenological reading. Okay, so a, a skull reading. Because the phrenologists uh, from uh, Austria and Germany believed that one's personality could be, could be kind of found and determined by the contours of the, of the skull. Okay, so I want to talk first of all about phrenology and about Blackwood's reaction to it, which is not, shall we say, very positive. Okay, so I'll, I'll begin. In September 1814, amidst considerable public interest in phrenology, the science, perhaps we should put that in inverted commas, of delineating character from an examination of the shape of the skull, the poet Lord Byron was visited by the German practitioner J. G. Spurzheim. After the physician had pronounced about the significance of the contours of the poet's head, Byron confessed himself a little astonished by Spurzheim's comment that everything developed in and on this same skull of mine has its opposite in great force, so that to believe him, my good and evil faculties are a perpetual war. Pray heaven, the last don't come off victorious. So the reading of Byron's, uh, Byron's skull. So Byron's admiration is, of course, rather joshing and jocular. But few of the great satirist peers, uh, especially amongst the satirical uh, wits of the early 19th century, were as charitable for knowledge. So to phrenology. So phrenology, or to use the alternative phrase, craniology, became very contentious in the late Georgian Romantic era, so the early 19th century. So on the one hand, adherents of phrenology praised the science as a master science, which was capable of unlocking the secrets of human personality. On the other hand, uh, his opponents condemned phrenology as the hair-brained ravings of absurd German theorists. Now, the uh, science of phrenology was particularly contentious in North Britain, especially in Glasgow and in Edinburgh. So I want to talk for the next 10 or 15 minutes about the reception of phrenology in Scotland, particularly in uh, the withering reception afforded the science by Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine, 1817 to 1980, the greatest, most contentious and most satirical of all post-Napoleonic literary magazines, as the Phrenological Journal, which was edited in, in the same street, oddly enough, George Street in Edinburgh in the 1820s, as Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine pointed out, and this is from the, from the Phrenological Journal, Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine has distinguished itself as the most persevering and the most absurd of all of the opponents of phrenology and of all of the enemies of phrenology. So from 1800 onwards, the founders of phrenology, Franz Joseph Gall and his disciple J. G. Spurzheim, proselytised for the cause of cranial analysis in a series of books which were quickly translated into English. Okay, that's a, a, a phrenological map from George Coombe's uh, gargantuan book in four volumes called uh, A System of Phrenology. And you'll see that this is uh, the kind of markings of the areas of the skull. Okay. So Gordon Spurzer argued that an individual's mental attributes consisted of separate faculties, such as adhesiveness, destructiveness, combativeness, and so on, each of which had its location or organ on the surface of the brain. So the larger the development of the brain with reference to these various, these various organs, then so you could, actually, uh, you could actually kind of track the development of the brain on the shape of the skull. So as the, thank you, as the skull uh, formed in childhood, then the, uh, the, various, uh, the various faculties, you could actually mark them on, on, on the skull. So as the skull hardens in childhood, it is shaped by the protuberances of the brain. So hence the importance of the external cranium and the reading of the cranium. So through the analysis of the skull, 
the phrenologist can determine the nature and personality of any individual. So here's an early 19th century phrenological map. Okay? So, those of you uh, wishing to, uh, to kind of engage with phrenological analysis might find it illuminating to do some practical phrenology. Okay? So, let's, let's do so. So, put a finger at the, the base, at the back, at the top of your neck, okay? And then move it up slightly to where the skull, to the base of the skull. And you should feel a lump, especially if you hold your head up straight. Can you, can you feel a lump? Okay. Right. Okay, so that, that is the, the, the bump at the base of the skull is the organ of amativeness. Okay. And it is, according to Gaul, the organ <coughs> faculty that gives rise to sexual feeling. So the larger your organ of amativeness, the more kind of uh, libidinous you are. Okay. Right, so... <laughs> Everyone's checking again, aren't they? So, so slightly behind the ear, uh, about, about half an inch behind the ear and up, you will feel your organ of combativeness. So if you're a, a quarrelsome and, a, and a, an aggressive person, you will feel a kind of a, a, a bump just above, <laughs> above your ear. If you are good-tempered and, and, and kind, there will be little cranial protuberance in this area. Now where the top of the jawbone meets the skull, this is the organ of alimentiveness. Okay, so watch out if you are well developed there, because uh, listeners uh, should beware. According to Spurzheim, this excessive alimentiveness, quote, gives rise to gluttony, drunkenness, and the love of strong liquors, <laughs> and also of smoking. Okay, so, <laughs> so you can track the appearance of the, the mind on, on, on the skull itself. So from its first appearance, in English, phrenological thought was highly contentious. Now, despite, uh, though there were there are antip antipathetic reviews in the first decade of the 19th century, it's only in the 1810s and 1820s that the debates over the validity of phrenology really developed, and particularly following that uh, visit in 1814 to England by Spurzheim, during which he met the author of Child Harold and Don Juan. Now it's that visit, uh, two months in England, two months in London, and then another month in, in, in Edinburgh, talking and lecturing about phrenology, mapping people's skulls, and, 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 and analysing uh, various notables of the day. So John Gordon, who was a professor of, of, uh, of medicine at the University of Edinburgh, wrote the first detailed attack on phrenology in the Eight Edinburgh Review in 1815. And he begins, the writings of doctors Gaul and Spurzheim have not added one fact to our stock of knowledge. Phrenology is nothing more than thorough quackery from beginning to end. So in the face of the Edinburgh's opposition, as Blackwoods noted, Spurzheim, quote, resolved to visit Edinburgh himself and to reply to the voice of opposition. So Spurzheim reads the article in the Edinburgh magazine, uh, sorry, in, in, in the Edinburgh Review. He comes up to Edinburgh and faces his critics head on. And he's tremendously popular and fashionable in, in, in the day. And all, lots of society folk come to have their, their skulls read and so on. So he goes to Edinburgh University itself and he dissects, he analyzes skulls, and then he has reception where people come to him and he reads their heads. So in the end, Spurzheim returned the following year and spent six months in Scotland, in, uh, in Edinburgh, where he met the indefatigable George Coombe, C-O-M-B-E, a man of law, in other words, a lawyer, uh, rather than a medical man, who is entranced by phrenology and gives up his legal practice and he becomes a phrenological uh, convert and journalist. And he founds the Phrenological Review, the, the, the foremost British phrenological uh, magazine for most of the 19th century. So his book, A System of Phrenology, published between the early 1820s and the 1840s, eventually runs to well over 1,000 pages in the, in the fifth edition. And a remarkable book it is. So he builds upon Spurzheim's tendency to illustrate phrenology by references to the heads of monarchs, statesmen, and warriors. So Coombe's work is littered with references to contemporary artists, musicians, and, in particular, authors. So, Coombe 
is the father of what might be called cranio-criticism, an interpretive practice which is taken up with enthusiasm by contributors to the phrenological magazine, which Coombe edited between 1825 and 1847. So it's throughout the craniological controversies, it's Edinburgh which is at the heart of the debate. So in both the phrenological journal and in the system of phrenology, literary criticism and phrenology go hand in hand. So authors are read in, in, a, in, a, in terms of what their skulls say about them. So by the analysis of the skull of Christopher Marlowe or Ben Jonson or Shakespeare, you can say a lot about their works. So, who argues with a straight face that the well-developed organ of combativeness evident on the head of Sir Walter Scott inspires the love of battles evident in the Waverley novels. Wordsworth, says Coombe, uh, is characterised by philoprogenitiveness, the love of children. The organ for the love of children is at the side of, of the top of the head. This, says Coombe, is the responsible for the poet's simplicities. Some of the faults of his manner, indeed, are clearly attributable to an excess of its influence. <laughs> Phrenological thought, as Alison will say, will, will, will point out, is that he's often kind of rampantly uh, racialist. And Coombe uh, illustrates the difference between the European skull and the non-European skull, between a comparison of the skull of uh, an anonymous uh, Peruvian uh, on one hand, on the right hand side, and this is, this is, some might say this is kind of loading the dice somewhat. On the other hand, the skull of Robert Burns. So you see that the concentrativeness organ is very large here. Okay? So this is a person who is, who is, who is capable of concentration and of great thought. But this flat-headed person, the Peruvian on the right hand side, is obviously <laughs> mentally deficient because of the, the, the lamentable uh, <laughs> shape of his brain. So Coombe also um, cites Burns in his discussion of benevolence. So the humanitarian vision of Robert Burns is due to the influence of his sizable organ of benevolence on the left hand side. Here, okay, so the, the, the kind of love, you know, a man's a man for all that, that's nothing to do with, it's not, this, is, this is the consequence of the shaping of the brain. Whereas uh, Griffith, who was a serial killer, early 19th century serial killer, is deficient in the, the organ of benevolence. Okay? So he's <laughs> murdered eight people. So you can tell that he's a murderous type because of, the, because of his skull. So Coombe's phrenological journal was explicitly founded to combat the antipathetic, uh, antipathetic reception of phrenology in the Edinburgh Review and most particularly in Blackwood. So in 1825, in the prospectus to the first number, Coombe writes this. The enemies of phrenology reply, sorry, rely upon falsehoods and malignities, impertinence and insolence, dull jokes, indecencies, nastinesses, and brutalities. Okay. So they say, well, yeah, we, we can respond to, uh, uh, to uh, responsible criticism, but we will not listen to the kind of unfair, satirical, kind of nose-thumbing of the likes of Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine. We pledge ourselves to honour and respect all candid, fair and philosophical opponents whose object, like our own, is scientific truth. But we do not approve, and we will not listen to, we will repel all offensive operations of satire by those we designate our enemies to brand their attacks as disgraceful, etc., etc., etc. 